Please, let's put our hands together for William Winkle. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, my presentation is called Myth of the Model City, the Uprising of 1967. I'm sure many of you have heard um, the, uh, and about the anniversary of 67, especially given all the events that were going on in the city in the past year. And what this talk, uh, the purpose of this talk is to really flesh out and pre present a nuanced view of what took place and why what took place happened. Uh, given uh, the amount of time I have, we're going to be starting uh, in the 60s, fresh off the bat. We're gonna, um, then we're going to backtrack to see what led into 67. Going into the mid-1960s, Detroit seemed happy, healthy, and progressive. Uh, going, uh, in 1964, the Wall Street Journal proclaimed Detroit to be a model city on race relations. They said if you need to have uh, a high-functioning, diverse urban area, look at Detroit, they know what they're doing, and they're doing it right. One of the reasons why we got that moniker was this march in the background here. In 1963, 125,000 Detroiters marched down Woodward behind Martin Luther King Jr., the Reverend C.L. Franklin, Walter Ruther, and Mayor Jerome Cavanaugh in what was the largest civil rights demonstration up until that time. This, the march was capped with King's first iteration of his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, and it was a real feather in the cap for the city. The city was seemingly progressive, powerful, and moving forward and acting as a leader in terms of race relations. The city at the time was still the fifth largest city in the country, we have about 1.67 million people. We were well regarded, we were still well regarded as the Austin Real Democracy, but the city was changing. We were becoming the motor city that didn't make cars anymore. One of the main changes for us was our leadership. Uh, right around the mid 1960s was when we see the, uh, the final shifts between the two major political parties. Uh, they spent, uh, the two parties spent the last 30 years changing platforms. And this is when we see the cementing of Detroit's now current political structure. Mayor Jerome Kavanaugh was the first in a long line of Democratic leadership that existed to, exists to today. He was a break in tradition in a lot of ways. He was young, he was energetic, and he was a Democrat. Detroit had a long line of Republican leadership up until Kavanaugh. He's primarily known for trying to do three things. Uh, bring in um, federal money into the inner city, uh, clean up and integrate the Detroit Police Department, and clashing with Mexico City to get to the 1968 Olympics. It can be argued he failed at doing all three. Detroit was on the up and up. We weren't having the same issues that many other cities were facing. Rochester, Harlem, and Philadelphia were currently on fire. Civic upheaval and civic unrest seemed to be a national issue that Detroit was uh, sidestepping miraculously. As a result, many people started to look at us, and I look at us closely but many, many things were missed. What we're looking at right here is a demographics map of Detroit from 1960. The dark uh, colored in areas are where people of color were allowed to live in Detroit, and the clear areas of the map are where the white community lived. Uh, a couple of you may have noticed I just said where the people of color were allowed to live in the city. Detroit was an extremely uh, segregated city with staunchly defended neighborhoods, and the organizations to back that up. Further complicating the model city moniker are these two maps right here. The top one is housing, and the, uh, the top one is employment, and the bottom one is deteriorated or dilapidated housing. As you can see, these two issues largely correspond to where people of color live and only routinely affect communities of color. The white community largely do not have to deal with these issues en masse. Furthermore, Despite the fact that the Detroit Police Department had 4,300 officers, only 143 of those officers were black. 95% of the police force was white, and the majority of that was southern white. Uh, bring, um, many recent arrivals from the south in the last 30 years, bringing with them Jim Crow and other uh, uh, prejudices that were prevalent in the south. Don't get me wrong, Detroit had uh, plenty of racists before, but bringing them with them a fresh, uh, fresh energy. Furthermore, uh, with that discrepancy in numbers, uh, the Detroit Police Department uh, engaged in routinely aggressive uh, tactics towards the inner city community. The two primary tactics to police 
uh, use were called the Big Four and investigative arrests. Many people point to and uh, talk about stress during this time, but stress wouldn't come till the late 1960s, early 70s. Uh, the big four were four, you know, uh, were four officers, one plain clothes, one, uh, one, no, sorry, one uniform, three plain clothes officers that would drive around in a four door unmarked sedan. Their catchphrase was, give me the corner. That was their catchphrase because in these areas where people of color lived, uh, they were densely, densely packed. Uh, uh, many of these areas, while they did have homes, the homes were subdivided, meaning instead of a single family living in a home, there was either two or four families living in that home, and there were apartment buildings. Given the high population density, there wasn't a lot of space to hang out with your friends. So as a result, many people hung out on the street. They hung out in street corners, relaxing and just chatting. Many Motown singers actually got their start singing on street corners. So when the big four pulled up, they said, give me the corner. If you didn't, you were either beaten, arrested, or both. Sometimes they would make a game out of it and they would say, if, I'm, if you're still standing here by the time I drive around the block, you're in trouble, stuff like that. Additionally, the Detroit Police Department would, would uh, conduct investigative arrests. They would pick people up on suspicion of having committed a crime. The crime could be as small as uh, numbers running or pickpocketing or as high as murder. What they would do is you pick you up, they put you in jail for three days, and on the third day they let you out saying, you're lucky we didn't find any info on you. You got let out of jail, sure but you lost your job for not showing up to work for three days. Additionally, it was, it was harder to get a new job because when your, uh, when your new prospective employer would call the police department to ask if you had a record, they would show them your permanent record and it would say, having, uh, he was picked up on having, uh, having committed a crime. Uh, this practice largely existed through the uh, 1950s. Over 40,000 people were picked up in 1957 alone. While this uh, uh, tactic was phased out in the late 1950s, uh, the marks on the criminal records remained to the mid-1960s and took an entirely separate effort to get those expunged. Uh, furthermore, in the mid-1960s, uh, Detroit's black community was in a state of flux. Uh, given uh, the urban renewal that took place in the 1950s and early 60s, uh, the black community was suffering economically and politically and despite comprising 30% of the city's population, they wield very, very little political, very little political power. One of the major uh, victories politically for the black community actually was getting Jerome Kavanaugh elected in 1962. So as I mentioned, Detroit uh, is highly segregated, staunchly defended, and this didn't just happen overnight. This is well planned, well executed, and decades in the making. And Detroit is not alone. Many other northern cities look exactly like this. When much of the civil rights legislation was written in the 1960s, it explicitly targeted the South and ignored the North. This is a demographics map of Detroit from 1940. Uh, Detroit, like the rest of the country, went through the Great Depression during the 1930s. But because the rumors were still strong that if you needed a factory job, you could get one in Detroit, many, many people kept coming. As a result, there was a massive housing crisis uh, due to the uh, lack of public and private uh, investment in housing due to the depression. When people began arriving in the city in droves, they found farmland, they found tents to sleep in, they found alleyways, potholes, wherever they could uh, lay their head. Um, it was far easier for the white community to find housing than for the black community. When the black community arrived in Detroit, the primary destination was Black Bottom, Paradise Valley, and the North End. There was another enclave on the west side, now called the Old West Side. But as the black community grew economically and uh, demographically, they found other pockets to fill in. And each of these other areas of the city demonstrates a different tactic that was used to deny black mobility. We have Conan Gardens on the east side and Eight Mile, Wyoming on the west side. Two of the primary tactics that were used to stop black mobility were called restrictive covenants and, the, and redlining. Restrictive covenants were legal maneuvers written into deeds that specifically said what race could buy a home. The two primary targets of restrictive covenants in Detroit were the black community and the Jewish community. But the Latino community, the, the Asian community, they were all targeted as well. 
Eight Mile Wyoming popped up because a group of urban pioneers, those were black folks who wanted to live in white areas and nicer housing, found out that, that this area was unrestricted. So a group of them got up and bought a bunch of homes and settled the area, founding a new neighborhood. When World War II began and there was now new funding and new purpose for building homes, 100,000 housing units were built on the west side alone. 98,000 of those were specifically earmarked for the white community only. Only 2,000 of them were open to people of color. Luckily enough, the Eight Mile Wyoming neighborhood was already established. When a real estate developer showed up to the neighborhood and saw the empty land next to them and said, this would be a great place to build a, build a new uh, subdivision, make a bunch of money, uh, be a great day. He goes to the Federal Housing Authority. The Federal Housing Authority was responsible for handing out mortgage insurance. If you wanted to buy a house, you needed a mortgage. If you wanted a mortgage, you needed mortgage insurance. And this is where redlining comes into play. The Federal Housing Authority had a color-coded system for providing mortgage insurance. Green and blue were perfectly fine. Yellow was uh, sketchy, and red was a big no. Red meant people of color lived there. Yellow meant people of color lived next to them. When he went to the Federal Housing Authority, they said, no, said, why not? Black people live there. Well, don't worry, I'm not gonna sell the black people, I'm gonna sell the white people. Black people still live there. What can I do? I don't know. What if I built a wall? He built a wall, he built a half mile long, six foot tall, one foot thick concrete wall called the Burwood Wall. That wall is still standing today. Uh, when the, black, uh, the majority of the black community came to Detroit, they came to Hastings Street. Uh, Hastings Street was the main thoroughfare of Black Bottom Paradise Valley in the North End. It was crammed, packed with businesses. Uh, dentists, doctors, insurance companies, lawyers, markets, haberdasheries, whole nine yards. If you needed something, you'd get it on Hastings Street. The problem with Hastings Street and what would be a major problem for the black community was just because the black community lived there does not mean the black community owned it. Additionally, Hastings Street was uh, the, the if not, uh, was one of the, if not the most um, old school neighborhood in the city. It was one of the oldest. It was uh, full of turn of the century buildings. If these buildings had plumbing and electricity, they were most likely retrofitted. Uh, we have oral histories from Black Bottom who said there were still outhouses in the neighborhood going into the 1940s. That would become a major issue for the black community going into the 1940s and into the 1950s. To ease this housing crunch, the federal government stepped in and said, we need a place for black war workers to live and public housing is gonna be the way we're gonna do it. Eleanor Roosevelt opened the Brewster Douglas Project herself and the third project on the list was the Sojourner Truth Housing Project. The federal government believed it was close enough to Conan Gardens on the east side not to cause a stir. They were mistaken. It was seven blocks within a white neighborhood at Seven Mile and Fenelon. And the residents, it's safe to say, were super pissed. Uh, they took this issue to their congressman who went to the floor of the house to denounce the federal government moving black people into his neighborhood. Uh, it became a massive tug of war between the residents, the city, and the federal government about what type of uh, project this would be, whether it be black, white, or mixed. Uh, during construction, it was just a massive tug of war. Finally, the federal government put its foot down and said, we need a place for black work workers to live, and this, this, that's the end of it. As tenants were beginning to move in to Sojourner Truth, they were greeted by this sign. Not only were they greeted by this sign, they were greeted by 1,200 very angry protesters. Uh, a scuffle ensued and the Detroit Police Department ordered all the tenants to leave saying they couldn't guarantee their protection. The tenants would later be moved in under the armed guard of the Michigan National Guard. A fully armed, machine guns, whole nine yards. Uh, the Sojourner Truth Housing Project would be the site of drive-bys and that's, that's people driving by and shooting into it, bricks through windows, and the occasional burning cross for the next few years. We don't just leave our violence behind at Sojourner Truth. Uh, the city boiled over in 1943 in the 1943 race riot. 
uh, preceding the 1943 race riot, though, was the Packard strike. Uh, the city is in the midst of World War II. We're pumping as much munitions into the war effort as we can. And one of those vital factories is the Packard plant. With, uh, with this Packard Motor Car Company. What they're doing is they're making engines. Uh, given the fact that uh, uh, everyone is needed for the war effort, there's a massive labor shortage still. The Packard solution was hire black people to do the same work. Three black men were promoted to the line at Packard, and the next day 25,000 whites walked off the job. Their placards read, I'd rather see Hitler or Hirohito win than to work next to a black man. And they weren't that kind in their language. Uh, the city boiled over into the 1943 race ride a short time later. Uh, there were over 100,000 people on Belle Isle that Sunday. And there were minor racial skirmishes here and there, but everyone went home that night. Uh, the best story we have is one of the young men who, uh, who was involved in the skirmishes that day went to the Forest Club in uh, Paradise Valley and was chatting with an acquaintance of his. Uh, he was telling him about the going on of the day and what would happen on the aisle. And then all of a sudden, the gentleman stood up, announced to the bar that a group of white men threw a black woman and her baby off the Belle Isle Bridge. Uh, the bar patrons didn't take too kindly to hearing that. So a group of them went over to the Belle Isle Bridge where a fight ensued with a group of military recruits. While that's going on, Another rumor is spreading around the white community that a group of black men assaulted a white woman downtown. The two rumors and the scuffles meet and it is brawling in the streets. It is two days of violence and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, the violence tended to break down with the black community targeting property, either through fire, just damage, or looting, while the white community targeted the black community itself. And that is reflected in the death toll through cold-blooded uh, murder, beatings, maulings, whole nine yards. It took 6,000 federal troops to come in and put it down. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt urged her husband, the president, to do a fireside chat on race relations to move the issue forward. Let's get over this. Uh, president Roosevelt declined in favor of getting war production back on track because war production fell 6%. Uh, we have a few stories from 43 that aren't Totally terrible. Uh, first one is this photo right here. We have a Detroit police officer protecting a young black man from an angry uh, mob. I would love to say that this is standard operating procedure, but unfortunately it wasn't. The Detroit Police Department was actually uh, dressed down pretty aggressively by the uh, federal troops who came into town and saw how they were acting, especially towards the black community. Uh, I, was, I had the pleasure of interviewing a woman who was there that day, and she, uh, for work, what she would do is she would pick up all the bills along Hastings Street from the businesses and take them down to City Hall to pay them all. So she collected the bills. Someone said, what are you doing? She said, I'm going to go pay these. So they're like, that's a terrible idea. Well, like, yeah, it'll be fine. So she hops on the Woodward streetcar and starts heading downtown. The only other person on the streetcar is an elderly white woman. Uh, they look ahead, they're seeing something, they can't quite make out what it is. It is a massive white mob. What white mobs have been doing during this time have been uh, going up and down Woodward, pulling black people out of bars, cars, streetcars, buses, and beating them. Uh, the white woman looks at her and says, I think you should get under my chair. I don't know what they're going to do. So they, she crawls under a chair, they cover her up with bags. Mob storms the streetcar. They look around, are you the only one here? Yep. Fine, and they exit the streetcar and the woman's protected. Uh, we leave a lot of the violence behind in the 1940s, but we have a brand new plethora of issues. Uh, we see the making of modern Detroit in the 1950s through mass deindustrialization, uh, through white flight and blockbusting, and furthering all of this is City Hall. Uh, City Hall at the time is run by Mayor Albert Cobo who ran an explicit campaign of stopping the black invasion of Detroit, and his policies do not do anything to either mend or improve the situation. Uh, restrictive covenants are ruled unconstitutional in 1948, and as a result, we see the explosion of homeowners associations across Detroit. A homeowners association called the Seven Mile Fennel and Homeowners Association 
was responsible for putting up the sign I showed you earlier, and their presence in the city only grew from there. Uh, homeowners associations would say that they're only there to protect home equity, to protect your investment. If you ask them how they were doing it, they were keeping black people out of the neighborhood. Uh, in the South, I'm sure many of you have heard of white citizen councils. They were our white citizen councils. Uh, throughout the 1950s, we see the, uh, the prevalence of the big four, investing of arrests explode. And then we see uh, neighborhood destruction and the cementing of modern Detroit through freeway construction. Uh, many people wouldn't really associate this quote with 1961, but Detroit's decline has been going on for a long while. Time Magazine said it, and for, with good reason. Between 1952 and 1960, Detroit lost 23.4% of the white community to the suburbs and elsewhere. The majority to the suburbs. Uh, that number is baffling to some, but it's actually really easy to explain. A number of things were happening to Detroit all at once. Detroit was facing mass deindustrialization like it had never experienced before. After World War II, the city built 19 new plants, um, sorry, the big three built 19 new plants, and those were not in the city of Detroit. They were in the suburbs and other satellite communities. They did that for a number of really good economic reasons. You didn't need to tear down your old factory to build a new one. The, uh, you could get away with uh, lesser taxes, because the, the suburbs were not nearly as strong as the city. They were changing the way factories were being built. They were no longer tall, multi-story plants. They were uh, large, single-story facilities, which meant you didn't need to buy out homeowners that were living across the street from your factory. And additionally, the federal government wanted the majority of the plants out of Detroit immediately. The federal government didn't want one nuclear bomb taking out 10% of, of the nation's manufacturing base. As a result, spreading it out was much safer uh, for the nation, but not for Detroit. As these plants are moving out of the city, the white community is following, because a lot of people don't want to drive 40 minutes to work. As a result, the white community begins uh, diminishing very quickly, but as you can see, the black community continues to grow. That is because the black community didn't have the same avenues of getting to the suburbs that the white community did. In order to move to the suburbs, you needed a house. In order to get a house, you either had a mortgage, had to get a mortgage to buy one or to, to build one. And to do that, you needed mortgage insurance and the black community still did not have access to mortgage insurance on mass. Even going into 1970, the suburban population of color stood at only 3.6%. While the factories are moving out, uh, other factories are dying. Packard and uh, Hudson Motor Car Companies uh, go out of business, they go bankrupt due to the rolling recessions in the 50s, and 90,000 jobs were lost on the east side in two years alone. Between 1947 and 1967, Detroit loses 47% of its manufacturing base. Uh, what you see here is a flyer from the West Side Home and Property Owners Protective Association arguing that if the freeways are built as they're proposed, your property values are going to be destroyed and drastic change will come to the city. And they are arguing that because they are partially right. Not about the property values thing, but drastic change was coming. Unlike other major cities where they use freeways to divide races, Detroit initially seemingly tried to use them to integrate. Uh, Instead of putting them between two neighborhoods, Detroit put uh, its freeway right up the middle of the black community. That picture I showed you earlier of Hastings Street, most of you have probably driven on Hastings Street. It's the I-75 freeway. Hastings Street is uh, gone, wiped away, along with all of its businesses and the black, much of the black community's economic might. Black Bottom it most, uh, is uh, demolished to make room for Lafayette Park, which I'm sure many of you have also seen. Uh, the city and um, national officials touted it as urban renewal. We're cleaning up the inner city. We're going to make it great for everyone living here. It's going to be a grand old time. People being evicted simply referred to it as Negro removal. Additionally, this outpouring of this seemingly mass migration of refugees from the uh, three neighborhoods sparked a great deal of fear 
and uncertainty in the rest of the city. Primarily just the rest of the city because the black community didn't have the means of moving to the suburbs. So as the black community began spreading across Detroit, many segregationist whites and many uncertain whites simply begin moving either to the farther edges of the city or moving out altogether. One tactic that was used during this, much to the detriment of the city, was called blockbusting. What blockbusting was, was a real estate agent would either hire a young black mother with a toddler and a stroller, uh, burly black men in larger cars, or um, uh, groups of black teens and young kids with bikes. They would do is they would have the mother walk down the street, or they'd have the men drive down the street slowly with their stereos cranked up, or they'd have the kids ride around the neighborhood on their bikes. They'd wait a day or two, and then they would call every house on the block. They're like, hey, we got this great new development in Royal Oak that you should totally check out. And uh, because it was, it, was, it was a common belief at the time that if a black person moved into your neighborhood, you just lost $15,000 on your house. So many people would sell low and get out before they lost any more money. And then the real estate agent would simply flip the house, uh, often to a unsuspecting person who couldn't make the payments in the first place, and the cycle would repeat itself, destroying Detroit's property values all across the city. And for many people, this was an easy decision to make because the freeways that are now brand new allow easy access to and from the suburbs. Uh, this is the area that was torn down to make way for the I-75 freeway. As you can see, this, the freeway makes up, a, uh, makes up a very tiny portion of it. Uh, the periphery of the freeway was also torn down to make room for development. But the problem was in the early 60s, there was no money for development, so the land sat empty for, uh, for years. One of the places that the black community went after Black Bottom and Paradise Valley was the Virginia Park neighborhood on the west side. The Virginia Park neighborhood was a Jewish neighborhood. Uh, it was far easier for black folks to move into Jewish neighborhoods and Christian neighborhoods because the Jewish community faced a great deal of the same discrimination that the uh, black community uh, dealt with. You can actually watch Jewish migration followed hand in hand with black migration. Uh, if you look at the demographics, it's pretty interesting. Uh, 12th Street was already a vibrant business district, business district uh, but was only amplified with the arrival of black merchants. Uh, I had everything you could possibly need. Uh, it was saying, there was a saying that if you need anything legal, you could get it there during the day. Also, if you need anything illegal, you could probably get it there at night. It was also the home of clubs, vice, gambling, prostitution, and as a result, garnered a very seedy reputation in the ranks of the Detroit Police Department. Which leads us to 67. On July 23rd, uh, the Detroit Police Department initiated a routine raid on a blind pig near the corner of 12th and Claremont in the Virginia Park neighborhood. There's a great deal to unpack there. Uh, blind pigs were illegal after hours clubs in, in the city of Detroit, both in the white and the black neighborhoods. They were illegal for two reasons. They didn't have a liquor license and they operated after 2 a.m. Many workers in the city, if they worked in the afternoon shift at the factories, got off about midnight, 1 a.m. As, as a result, they wanted to go relax with their friends and couldn't do it if the bars closed at 2. Uh, blind pigs were uh, prevalent all across the city. This one just happened to be in the black neighborhood. When the police arrived and scouted it out, they expected to find 10 to 15 people. This was routine and easy uh, work for the Detroit Police Department. What they would do is they bust in the door, arrest everyone, charge them $27.50, uh, people pay it right away, and then the people will probably go back to drinking that same night. This night didn't go as planned. What happened was when they raided the blind pig, they found 83 people in a space fit for 40. They stumbled upon a party for two Vietnam vets. As a result of the uh, size of the group and how few officers there were, uh, the arrests didn't go as planned. They only had one paddy wagon available to ferry people to the 10th precinct, so it took over an hour to get everyone out of there. That caused a great deal of issues. Soon there were more people on 12th Street than police across the entire city. 
you probably asking yourself, why were so many people on the street at three o'clock, now four o'clock in the morning? It was insanely warm. Uh, this was before air conditioning. This is a very densely populated area. If you were in your, uh, if you didn't want to be sweating in your bed, you were walking around because it was cooler to be outside. And if you were sweating in your bed, you had your windows open and you could hear the commotion really early on. And given that this was the time before cell phones, it was better to see something for yourself than to wait for something to pounce on you. As the final arrestees were loaded up and the police cruisers began driving away, a bottle is thrown by William Scott III and shatters the back window of a police cruiser and the uprising begins. It's important to note that uh, while 67 was spontaneous, uh, there were long-standing grievances that fueled it and maintained it for the five days, or the relatively five days that it lasted. Uh, much of the grievances can be filed into three categories, predatory business owners, uh, disingenuous landlords, and continued terrible police community relations. Uh, we have many stories from uh, terrible business owners in the inner city neighborhoods. Uh, I interviewed two Wayne State students who spent their free time going to different AMP markets in the inner city and checking the food to make sure it was good still. They routinely found moldy vegetable, moldy fruit, expired baby formula. Uh, additionally, uh, I interviewed a principal who was principal of Hutchins Middle School in Virginia Park. Someone had recently stolen all of their musical equipment and one of the kids tracked it down to a pawn shop. As they were pulling up, the principal said, uh, we, as we were going in the front, we saw a giant white van driving out from the back and all the instruments were gone. Uh, when he came back from vacation after 67, he said, that pawn shop was burned down. I'm pretty sure I know the kid that did it and I would have been standing next to him if I would have been home. Uh, if you were a person of color in Detroit during the 50s and 60s, it was well known that you would pay $50 for a $40 house in a $30 neighborhood. And we're not talking about a posh apartment with great views of the river either. These are subdivided homes, and these are uh, older apartments that don't offer the same amenities as today. Additionally, it was more expensive to live in a subdivided home in the inner city than to have a brand new house all to yourself on the west side. And while 67 may seem widespread, as it touched many parts of the city, a small, only a small percentage of the city was engaged in what was going on, and many honest store owners and uh, citizens got caught in the middle and lost everything. The Detroit Police Department were engaged from the beginning, along with the Detroit Fire Department. There were 4,700 Detroit police officers, uh, 1,200 Detroit firemen, the Michigan State Police and the Michigan National Guard joined Sunday afternoon. 1,100 Michigan State Police came to town. 7,000 Michigan National Guardsmen came into the city. And on Tuesday morning, 5,000 federal troops entered the city. I mentioned earlier that the crowd grew faster than the police presence did. And that was not a hard milestone to me. Uh, it was uh, at the lowest, uh, the police department was at its uh, lowest amount of officers during the week during this period and there are only 200 on duty out of 4,700. Uh, it was a hot weekend of July and a whole lot of people left to go fishing pretty much which caused a very um, chaotic situation to unfold when trying to deal with the situation. As the Detroit Police Department attempted to formulate a response, civic leaders were going into the community in, a, in an attempt to get people to go home. Uh, freshly elected Congressman John Conyers and Arthur Johnson, head of the NAACP in Detroit, go to 12th Street, they stand on the top of Art Johnson's car, and they beg and plead folks to go home. They say, we're going to make this right, it's going to work. They're eventually shouted down and pelted with whatever people can find, and they get out of there. John Conyers would later say he didn't even think a Malcolm X could have gotten those people to go home. While they're doing that, uh, local pastors are organizing in an attempt to get people to go home. And Mayor Kavanaugh and, uh, not yet judge, but soon to be judge Damon J. Damon J. Keith are calling every <clears throat> radio station, every television station, every newspaper, anyone that talks to the public in mass and telling them, do not say the word riot. Don't talk about the smoke. Don't talk about fires. Just say, hey, today's a great day to go home. You, everyone should just go home and just stay in your house. 
They're also calling preachers and asking them to slip that in their sermon as well. After 67, they would also ask preachers to slip in the sermon. If you stole anything, drop it off at night and you won't get in trouble. Uh, so as this, was, uh, as this is going on, the Detroit Police Department is assembling some of its officers back and they attempt uh, to retake, essentially retake Virginia Park because the area is, uh, police and firemen withdraw from the area because they can't formulate a response. As the police uh, go to sweep the streets in this formation right here, uh, their crowd control fell apart in roughly 20 minutes. And that's from the special assistant to the police commissioner. What happened was when the police would fly up to sweep the streets, they didn't have anyone to cover the side streets. So the crowd would split in half, they would run down the alleyways and get right back up behind them, making crowd control seemingly impossible. When the National Guard came to town, they not only came to town with no formal training whatsoever in how to handle this, but many of them had not experienced two things before in their lives. Uh, the first, the training, uh, that's a big claim to make, and I can have the evidence to back it up. Uh, we have an interview with a man who was with the Michigan Air National Guard. And his job was, uh, he was a clerk at Metro Airport. He would drive to Metro Airport every weekend, push papers for him, and then go home. That Sunday, he arrived to Metro Airport to push papers, and a commanding officer came into the office, ordered everyone down onto the, onto the tarmac, taught, they taught them how to march for two hours, gave them guns, and shipped them downtown without bullets. Uh, we have other stories of uh, other National Guardsmen who were trained how to fight the Soviets, not patrol the streets of Detroit. Further complicating the no training for this, was the fact that many National Guardsmen were from Western and Northern rural Michigan. Many of them had seen a building taller, taller than six stories, let alone more than one next to each other, and many of them had not seen a black person before. Uh, they came into town with nothing but fear and stereotypes, which I can say did not lend itself well to the situation. And complicating everything is politics, because why not? <laughs> Uh, bottom right is uh, Mayor Jerome Kavanaugh, Democrat. Middle is Governor George Romney, father of Mitt Romney, Republican. And top left is President Lyndon Johnson, Democrat. This is before the 1968 election. Johnson has not yet announced he will not seek re-election, or maybe he hasn't decided yet. Romney has announced that he will be seeking the Republican nomination for president. And, John, and uh, Kavanaugh is being touted as a possible primary challenger to Johnson because Johnson is incredibly unpopular due to the Vietnam War. And Johnson knows all of that. Uh, very quickly, Kavanaugh begins clamoring for state aid because the police department can't handle it. Romney is more than happy to come to town because he wants this as a feather in his cap when he runs as the law and order candidate in 68, which is what Richard Nixon will do. Very quickly, it becomes evident that the National Guard can't handle the situation, and Kavanaugh begins clamoring for federal intervention. Johnson and Romney both don't want to do that. Romney doesn't want him to do it because that would mean Johnson stealing his victory, and Johnson doesn't want to do it because Romney and Kavanaugh's political careers are burning down with the city of Detroit. Eventually, uh, Romney agrees and sends a telegram to Johnson recommending the use of federal troops in the city of Detroit. Johnson sends a telegram back saying, you do not recommend to the president. He sends another one requesting the use of federal troops in the city of Detroit, and he agrees to it technically. 5,000 uh, uh, troops are sent to Selfridge Air Force Base. As I didn't do it. As part of Task Force Detroit. See if it works. Yeah, it still works. Uh, as far as Task Force Detroit, and they're sent to Selfridge Air Force Base 20 miles outside the city limits of Detroit where they're not allowed to leave. Only two, uh, two officials come into the city, General Throckmorton and Cyrus Vance, who patrol the city Monday night with city officials and, and Romney, uh, well, Monday afternoon. And they see nothing. They don't see fires, they don't see looting, they got a flat tire, that was about it. Uh, they announced that we missed it. Sorry, guys, we came so late. The situation seems to be under control. Kavanaugh is freaking out. He's like, it's not over. This happened last night. It's a lull. I promise you it's going to get worse. Romney is pretty pleased. He's like, thank you guys for coming. We have this situation. 
and the situation handled. It's all good. They announced the federal uh, government will not be stepping in. Federal troops will be leaving again soon. And Monday night is the worst night of the uprising. Soon they change their tune and federal troops take over the east side uh, on Tuesday morning about 2 a.m. While the city is calming down, we have one, one of the, if not the worst instance of the uprising, the Algiers Motel incident and or the Algiers Motel massacre. Um, Wednesday morning, uh, there are reports of sniper fire coming from near the area of the Algiers. A National Guard unit, a Michigan State Police unit, three Detroit police officers, a black security guard, and two military MPs converge on the Algiers, believing it to be the source of the sniper fire. The Detroit Police Department are the first ones in the door. And this is where um, multiple stories start to emerge, but the best information we have is this. Uh, they find Carl Cooper coming to either down the stairs or around from the stairs, and they shoot him in the chest, killing him. Next, they find Fred Temple on the phone with his girlfriend, and they shoot him in the chest. They finish sweeping the rest of the first floor, and then order everyone to come downstairs. They line everyone up against the wall. Left are two white women and seven black men. Uh, they begin beating and berating those along the wall. The Detroit Police Department are leading the effort. Uh, they specifically target the two white women, repeatedly asking them, why, why aren't white men good enough for you? Why are you cavorting with black men? What are you doing? They would strip them and beat them. This is where the, military's MP, the military MPs left from, quote, things took an ugly turn. The last thing a military MP saw was a Detroit police officer holding a shotgun between a man's legs and threatening to blow his balls off. Next up, the Michigan State Police go out to their commanding officer and say, the Detroit Police Department is committing civil rights violations, they're beating those people, what do we do? The commanding officer says, that sounds like a Detroit Police Department problem, and they all leave. Left are the three Detroit Police officers led by Senek, Officer Senek, and um, the National Guard unit and the Black Security Guard. And this is when the execution game begins. Senek pulls a man into a side room and pretends to shoot him. When he comes out, he says, this is what happens when you don't tell me where the gun is. You should have cooperated. He winks at the leader of the National Guard, who takes another man into a side room and pretends to shoot him. Officer Senek then asks uh, Officer Paley if he feels like shooting anybody today. Officer Paley grabs a man off, uh, grabs a man off the wall, throws him into a side room, and throws him into the same room as a now dying Fred Temple, and he shoots Aubrey Pollard in the chest, killing him. All this takes place within roughly 30 minutes. Uh, the National Guard take the two white women away, and the rest of the men are ordered to leave. This is successfully covered up for about five days. Uh, the three men are listed as riot-related casualties, specifically they got into a firefight with each other and killed each other. Uh, that is called in and, uh, by the clerk of the motel and is ruled by the Wayne County Coroner. The families reject this immediately. They think it is one of the most foolish things they've ever heard. They are able to sneak back into the Algiers, take their own photographs, do their own investigation. The news breaks the story and the free press carries it home. Soon, two of the officers confessed to what they did, Officers Paley and Officer August, and uh, Senek is out to confess before his confession is interrupted by his defense attorney. Uh, those two officers are brought up on charges in Detroit and acquitted. The three Detroit police officers and the black security guard are brought up on federal charges, and the trial is moved to all-white Mason, Michigan, where another all-white jury acquits all four men. The Detroit police were racist, the National Guard didn't know what they were doing, and the federal troops put it down. I heard this more than once, conducting the oral history project and doing uh, my own independent research, and it holds up fairly well. Officially 43 dead, uh, nearly 1,200 injured, over 7,200 arrested, and as you can probably guess, there aren't that many jail cells in the city of Detroit, nor in, are there that many in southeastern Michigan. Arrestees were picked up for not only um, 
uh, looting and arson and stuff like that. But the majority of them were picked up for curfew violations. If you were out past nine or out before five, uh, you were most likely rounded up in mass and arrested as quickly as possible to get you off the street. Uh, many uh, people who were arrested were thrown in makeshift facilities and packed in there as tightly as possible. They were put in basements, they were put in garages, they were put in cages, they were put in buses. Uh, Belle Isle became a major holding facility later in the week and was nicknamed Belcatraz. And the conditions were not very favorable to them at all. Uh, I interviewed one man who was kept in a garage for a day and the only fresh air they got if someone mouthed off to the police and they closed the doors was they were given a hose to flush the drain they were all going to the bathroom in. They would take that hose and they would hold it up to their nose so they could breathe the fresh air that was coming out with the water. Uh, one of the major uh, things people point to is increased wife, uh, was wife flight began in 67, but it increased for sure. And the proliferation of firearms across the city was a major, major moment for the city. There were more handguns sold in the first six months of 1968 than the entire year of 1967. And that masked the real number of guns sold because it was far easier to buy guns in Toledo than it was in Detroit. So many people would simply drive the 45 minutes down to Toledo, buy their guns, and come back. Uh, this, uh, the same is true for long guns, such as rifles and shotguns as well. Uh, there are many myths and misconceptions that surround 67. That's part of the reason we really wanted to do this project. In terms of looting, uh, many people immediately believe or assume that the black community were the looters during 67. Looting was highly integrated. Uh, Hubert Locke, who was the special assistant to the police commissioner, uh, would, would say in his oral history that he thinks 67 was one of the most integrated things Detroit has ever done. One of the first things he, he saw was a, picture, uh, was a picture of two white guys and two black guys running past him by the couch. He's like, that's new. Uh, additionally, pawn shops played a really interesting role in the spread of looting. The activist General Baker talks about how pawning was the central pillar of his community's economy at the time. And on the back of every pawn slip, it would say, will not replace in case of fire, theft, or flood. So a bunch of his neighbors looked at, them, looked at each other and said, well, if someone's going to steal my stuff, it's going to be me. And pawn shops were, in fact, some of the first places hit because many residents were running in, stealing their item back, and going home. But seeing 40 people rush into a store, especially multiple stores, doesn't really bode well for the situation. Additionally, we have uh, anecdotal evidence, we don't have any hard evidence yet, of interstate looters. Uh, I interviewed one man by the name of John Eddings, who lived off of Linwood at the time. And as he was driving over Linwood, he looked down the street, and he had never seen so many out-of-state license plates in his life. Ohio, Illinois, Indiana were all represented at noon on Sunday. Additionally, we have another story by, uh, from a man by the name of Richard Rybinski, who lived in uh, Midtown at the time. And he was like, I'm tired of listening to the radio. I really gotta figure out what's going on for myself. So he hops on his bike and starts riding around the neighborhood. One of the times he's riding around, he's standing at a street corner and the station wagon pulls up with a trailer attached and a Ohio license plate on the front and two old white guys in the seats asking, where's the looting at? Um, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, videos from 67 and the fire sticks out pretty uh, prevalently. prevalently. Uh, we have stories of those fires being intentionally set for insurance money. The problem was, if you burn down one building, you most likely burn down a strip. And if you burn down that strip, you most likely burn down the residential areas behind it. Detroit was built incredibly packed in, and it was very warm and very dry. Uh, the wind was so strong that it would often carry fire over a building and to hit another. That's why if you're ever looking, you're like, how did that one house in the middle survive? It's because the wind literally picked it up and brought it over. Um, furthermore, uh, fire was not the only major cause of damage in the city. Uh, bullets were. In five days, the Michigan National Guard shot off 155,000 rounds. That number always blew my mind. I was like, how is that possible? And speaking with a man who trained with the National Guard, the tactic at the time was if someone shoots at you, 80% of the people you're with begin shooting in that general vicinity and the other 20% move to flank. So if you got shot at, you're unleashing dozens if not hundreds of bullets in a general area, inflicting a great deal of damage. Additionally, uh, the favorite target of 
National Guardsmen were street lights. It was believed if a sniper could see you, a sniper could shoot you. So they would shoot out the street lights where they were stationed and where they were patrolling. Grand River, Woodward, Jefferson all had the street lights shot out. And uh, where they were stationed were civic buildings. They were stationed at parks, schools, other government buildings, civic centers that all had their floodlights shot out as well. And they certainly didn't replace them when they left. That same principle I mentioned earlier. So when he came home, he went straight to the school. He looked up, saw, he said, not only were all my floodlights shut up, but my building was shut up because he couldn't hit the damn floodlights. Uh, sniping in uh, regards to 67 is incredibly confusing. Uh, sniping is misleading. We have a lot of shooters in 67. Snipers are good shots. Uh, though the primary target of those shooters were fire trucks, specifically when the firemen would pull up, they'd start shooting at the truck and the firemen would leave. So the question is, why were they doing that? Were they simply trying to stop people from authorities from coming back into the neighborhood? Were they trying to stop that fire from being put out? Uh, we don't know. I haven't met one. I would love to speak with a, uh, a sniper just to get their get their motivation down. Uh, additionally, the majority of people arrested for sniping were white. And then the biggest myth and misconception of all is that white flight started in '67 and the city was hunky dory before that. Throughout this presentation. I've used the term uprising. That is a conscious decision. There are four main terms used to describe what took place. Uprising, riot, rebellion, and civil unrest slash disturbance. Riot is primarily used by the white community, suburbanites, and political, con political conservatives. It focuses on the spontaneity of what happened, the criminality of what took place, and lays the majority of the blame for what happened at the feet of the black community. Rebellion is primar primarily used by the black community, Detroiters and political progressives. It focuses on not so much on the spontaneity, but the reasons and the, his, the historical grievances that fueled it. It sidesteps uh, the damage and pushback as part of the righteous struggle, and also lays the majority of the blame at the feet of the white community for allowing the conditions to persist long enough to spark such an event. Uprising is uh, an amalgam of the two. It says. While it was spontaneous, it was fueled by long-standing grievances that permeated through the community. Uh, except that in violent uprisings, criminality and damage happens. But it also divvies up the blame for how, not only what took place, but how it played out. And that usually depends on whoever you're talking to at that particular moment. Uh, civil disturbance is used by uh, usually people who aren't trying to take a side, just like journalists or news anchors or people who are just trying to make a quick point and then move on. Uh, there are problems with all of them. Uh, people who use the term re uh, riot don't like the term uprising or rebellion because they believe it lets criminals off the hook and it allows, allows lazy people to continue to be lazy. People who, like to, uh, who use the term rebellion don't like the term uprising because they believe it dilutes the black community's right to rebel. Um, and so many people find problems with these terms. But as long as we understand the perspective that leads to each term, it allows for much greater conversation. Insurrection, riot, I mean, insurrection, revolution, and war were also used during this week uh, and also used to describe this week. At the bottom, race riot is grayed out. We, the Detroit Historical Society, do not believe what took place in 67 was a race riot. It wasn't get that police officer, he's white. It's get that police officer, he's been beating me up for 20 years. It wasn't get that store owner, he's white. Is get that store owner, he stole, uh, he helped sell my instruments that were stolen, stuff like that. Uh, it was far more anti authoritarian and anti authority than uh, based on race. It's important for us to be able to frame and conceptualize 67 because other people are doing it for us. Life Magazine called it a revolt, Time Magazine called it a riot, Catherine Bigelow called it a war. So it doesn't really uh, matter if we have different. Uh, perspectives on it, as long as we have the ability to understand the various perspectives that are, uh, surround 67. For all the destructive things that came uh, about in 67, a lot of, uh, for all the destructive things that came about because of 67, many constructive things happened as well. Detroit has always been an activist town, and that didn't change with 67. There are a huge number of organizations that stepped up to the plate and organized in order to help bring the city back from seemingly the brink of the abyss. At the institutional level, there was New Detroit and Focus Hope. Uh, 
Also, the election of Coleman Young in 1974 did a great deal for the city. And um, that's really all I usually say about Coleman Young because in this town, you either love Coleman Young or you hate Coleman Young. And everyone will grandstand until the end of time itself. Uh, but grassroots activism was where it's at. Uh, Ad Hoc Action Group was founded by Sheila Cockrell, who was an anti police brutality group. People Against Racism was founded by Frank Joyce, who was an anti racist, anti war in Vietnam group. Uh, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers was our Black Panther Party. They originally began as the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, which sought to get supervisor positions and better paying positions at the Dodge Main Plant in Hamtramck, but really branched out into the social sphere, sphere with youth groups and career training and other um, positive community benefits. One of those uh, programs that came out from a unification called the Motor City Labor League was the Conflict Control Change Book Club. It was a group that uh, sought to socialize white progressives to the black radical perspective. Basically, you want to know why we're mad, read this book and we'll talk about it. They constantly had to find new spaces because they kept growing and growing and growing. And at their peak, they had about 350 members, active members. Uh, the citywide citizens, yeah, the citywide citizens action committee and the inner city business improvement forum, or other black nationalist groups that really sought to rebuild the black community's economy through co-ops and other economic uh, initiatives. They were rather successful until the recessions in the 1970s uh, hurt them pretty badly. And fighting all of these folks at once was breakthrough. Uh, Raise your hand if you know Don Lobsinger. Name, know the name Don Lobsinger. Ooh, surprise. So Don Lobsinger was a right-wing activist who's still very mad today. Uh, he got his start in the early 1960s. He, he got a name for himself uh, for dropping dead rats on the Chinese ping pong team at Kobo, for interrupting the Soviet symphony, for threatening to hang seemingly everyone. But his big break came in 1968 when because of him, uh, the Gross Point chief of police had to sit on Martin Luther King Jr.'s lap on the way to the Gross Point speech and away from the Gross Point speech. Uh, he was able to sneak in and uh, denounce King as a traitor and a communist. Uh, we get asked multiple times, why are we doing this project? Uh, our project director was asked, why pick a scab off an old wound? He replied with, what makes you think the scab ever formed? Uh, there are many people in Detroit who still talk about 67, and that is because 67 continues to affect our daily lives. It affects city civil relations, it affects race relations, and as long as we continue to talk about 67 in our tight little silos, the conversation is going to go nowhere. So we hopefully, through this project, are going to be breaking down those silos, which allows us to have greater conversations and more meaningful conversations. To do this, we put together the Detroit. 19, uh, the Detroit 67 Project. Um, the first initiative we did was launch the Detroit 1967 Oral History Project, which to date has collected over 500 perspectives uh, from 67. That has fueled our community engagement initiative, which to date has over 100 formal partners and 50 informal partners. Uh, because we knew we only had a limited amount of space in our exhibit, we put together the Detroit um, companion, 1967 companion book, Detroit 1967 Origins, Impacts, Legacies, which is really the, the best Detroit historians all in a tight little book, plus me. Uh, Danielle McGuire, uh, Kevin Boyle, Ken Coleman, Tom Segru, Roy Finkenbein, really Detroit's premier historians dissecting uh, the problems that led to 67 and present them in a compact and relatable and easy to read way, promise that. <clears throat> and the final step was unveiling our exhibit at the Detroit Historical Museum called Detroit 67 Perspectives, which focuses on 1917 to the present and really lays out and flushes out uh, the story of 67. These are some of our academic partners. These are some people who gave us money. <laughs> And these are different exhibits that also went on across the city during the last uh, year. Uh, we are the only one that, are, that is still up. But this shows the commitment that the cultural community uh, put forth in understanding, dissecting, and talking about 67. And thank you so much, Google. It was great. I probably said, uh, like a lot. But other than that, it was great.